Okay, I, I think, I think we're live. I don't know why every single time I do this thing, it throws me a loop, right? It throws me a challenge. But what I do know is that as long as I keep showing up one of these times, I'm going to know what I'm doing. <laughs> That's the idea. Anyway, welcome to Storytime. I'm Kimberlyn, and I'm here at the studio at Life's Work Yoga here in Frederick, Maryland. And in fact, there's a lot of activity today. Granted, it's just me doing the activity, but I have decided to shift my attention towards reopening the studio for real-time practice within, in, with real people in the space. Now, fingers crossed that our local numbers continue to uh, move in the direction that will make that possible. But in the meantime, I have a photo shoot coming up, and so I needed to reorient the space so that it does look welcoming for not just me to be here for my personal practice and for broadcasting practices, but also for the foundation practice, which is a place, a safe place to do the practice of yoga. Now, all month long in story time and in Coach's Chat and, and in my social media conversation, I've been talking about Ahimsa. This is the foundation principle to yoga philosophy, at least according to the Yoga Sutras written by Patanjali. In fact, Ahimsa is the first yama. Yama meaning our virtues, our values, our moral principles. And what I'm noticing about Ahimsa in this current climate of physical distancing and all of the extra efforts to maintain cleanliness and safety and protection from something that is purely invisible, right? Obviously, once the symptoms arrive, it's another story, but trying to maintain a wellness practice in an environment that seems so threatening is already a challenge. And it's a challenge because we don't know if our efforts will be fruitful, if it will be a guarantee. Well, isn't that ironic? Because really there is no guarantees in life. And yet when it comes to feeling threatened and taking mm, courageous efforts, a guarantee, a promise, someone who's in charge making decisions helps us to reestablish that calm abiding space, that sense of, we can do this. We got this. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the effort of doing acts of love. And specifically, I talked last week a little bit about what I have delineated as four levels of action, right? And so in that sense, they are the action of doing, of non-doing, of redoing, and undoing. Now that may be simple enough to understand that the action of doing is when we choose to do something in a physical way, whether it's by way of our energy, by way of our body, by way of our thoughts and our minds and our feelings, we do something with a layer of intentionality, purpose, right? The same can be said in its reverse, in that when we choose not to do something, it may require more effort. It's why we use the phrase, you know, I bite my tongue. I want to say something, but I don't want to say something, right? So we have these non-doing efforts as much as we have the doing efforts. And choosing which one of those is a big deal. But there's also two more layers of action when it comes to doing and non-doing. And I define those as the redoing. This is when we take responsibility, when we apologize for something that maybe we made a mistake or we acted too rashly or overreacted, right? But really it's about redoing something that I have previously done in an attempt to honor my principle, my practice, ahimsa, right? The foundation of loving. If I've done something and it has causes harm, right? My personal practice of reframing from love is about giving the benefit of the doubt. Now that's 
a separate practice in and of itself, and yet I find that it helps me hold on to hope, which interestingly enough is the topic that we'll be talking about next month in March. So hold the thoughts on hope. In terms of love, right? Practicing love, doing acts of love, whether it's love for ourselves in terms of self-care, whether it's love for our children, for our parents, for our partners, for our pets, for others, a general curiosity and kindness when we're out in the world, right? This is acts of love. Picking up someone else's garbage, however, is when we amend someone else's wrong. I call that the undoing, right? Picking up my own garbage, right? If I'm got a, a treat while out walking around downtown Frederick and I stopped at a, a bakery and got myself a sweet treat, right? Putting the garbage in the garbage when I'm done is my responsibility, right? That's an act of contributing to a world that I want to live in. In other words, it's an act of love. But when I find perhaps someone else who has inadvertently, we're going to assume that it was not intentional, left some garbage along the way. I could choose to pick that up in an effort to undo someone else's wrongdoing, someone else's inadvertent, unintentional, accidental. It doesn't matter at that point what the intention was. The fact that I have the ability to act and reverse what could be the consequences of that initial action. Now, not everything as closed, right, as done and undone. A lot of times what's been done has been done so cyclically, so mm, deep into our culture that we don't even realize that we're doing it. And what I'm talking about here is all of our isms, right? Whether it's racism or sexism or, or genderisms or whatever isms that we have that seem normal so that those who are outside that normal parameter have to make an identity statement of who they are. That in itself is the undoing that I'm referring to as an act of love, right? Yes, if I misspeak, which I know I do, I'm still learning the language of love, particularly in the context of this modern world, particularly in the context of having to relearn the things that I learned growing up, a different time, a different era, a different language. And I'm all for learning, but learning takes time and it takes time and effort. Have you ever noticed that some things are harder to learn than others? Just like some things are harder to do than others. Lifting a 20 pound barbell is a lot more difficult than lifting a two pound barbell. Now, as a mama of a baby, lifting a 20 pound barbell repeatedly was a whole lot harder than lifting a 20 pound baby. <laughs> Why is that? Well, there's a whole lot of psychology behind that, right? But in my experience, it was because the baby needed my attention and we had this reciprocal relationship. The barbell didn't need my attention and in fact, didn't receive any benefit from me engaging in a repetition of barbell curls. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't lift the barbell, particularly if we're working on strengthening or Mm, rehabilitating an injury. But for sure, we want to be able to connect and interact with the baby, whether the baby is an infant or the baby is now an adult and in this moment asks for my attention, right? The relationships that matter most, those are the ones that I want to give my attention to. Those are the ones that I want to choose wisely what kind of action and fundamentally how that action can reflect love. So how do we get specific in that? If I'm looking for ways to act in love, it's not about getting approval. It's not about being seen as being someone who is generous or loving. It's about actually being someone who is generous and loving. So in that sense, intentional inaction. For my self-care right now is avoiding things that are made with ingredients that hurt me. I'm lactose intolerant. Ah! So I am avoiding, actively trying to avoid things that contain milk. However, to replace that or in instead of milk, I'm doing something different. I'm 
using alternatives to milk in order to still have that sensation or that kind of experience of, say, milk in my coffee. These are not necessarily worldly actions of love, but they are ways in which I can self-love and navigate little habit changes to move my impact of my social existence more towards the arc of justice, as Martin Luther King Jr. has, has encouraged us to trust that history is moving in that direction. I hope that I am contributing to that arc towards justice. So in this nation or in this, this notion of, of uh, my self-care, redoing past mistakes, right, is also about learning how to adjust my daily practice so that it is honoring. Let me give you an example. I love exercise and I have been an exercise junkie my entire life started with dance and then as I got more into my teenage years and my young adult years it actually became a compulsion of addiction and I was over exercising and so today no longer in my 20s or 30s barely in my 40s I still have some residue of that addictive behavior towards exercise and so one of the ways that I practice new techniques of strategies and new kindnesses, new ahimsa in my health care, in my wellness routine, is to practice more rest. That's the foundation of the strategy Breathe, Move, Rest that I teach here at Life's Work Yoga. So what does that mean? It means that I'm trying to learn from my mistakes of where I pushed my body too hard to the point where I caused injury and potentially forever permanent harm. Now, I rehabilitate my shoulder all the time, but the fact of the matter is, it was my over-pushing that caused the injury or caused the accident that resulted in my injury. Also, with that said, I'm still working to amend some of the lessons that I taught my children unintentionally about fitness, about appearance, about exercise, about food and finishing your plate, for example. So amending those past misteachings, my own mislearnings, is part of my daily living of ahimsa and of my own personal self-care as well as the loving that I show to my friends, my family, my students. So those are a few examples I hope that can make ahimsa more tangible, but in being more tangible, it's not just about giving love. But it's also about recognizing the love that we receive, the way in which those around us can demonstrate love, even if it's not necessarily a perfect match for what we want. Recognizing love in an effort is part of the practice of ahimsa, part of the practice of reframing from love. So I would love to hear from you in terms of how is ahimsa your practice of choice? How are you doing and non-doing things that contribute to love and good and hope? And where is it perhaps there is efforts to redo and undo things that did not land in the way that you had hoped, did not reflect the love that we want to share, that we have to give. So I look forward to hosting live students again in the studio, but in the meantime, we are offering virtual practices, both on the mat and virtual book studies, for example. Tonight we wrap up our study of the inner tradition of yoga by Michael Stone, and we begin the next book study, which is Living Your Yoga by Judith Hanson Lassiter. So if you would like to join us for a book club, please consider that. Reach out. Let me know how I can support you because we're in this together. And it really does begin with finding what we can say yes to and finding a community that will support us along that path. Be well. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing these moments with me. Good luck in living your story of love. May you breathe deeply, move freely, labor lovingly, and live vibrantly. Namaste.